I am I call for the light of God that never fails. I call for the light of God that never fails. I call for the light of God that never fails. Blaze with light of God, I call the world around the world. by the power of the sacred fire from the heart of Alpha and Omega. We ignite these flames from the threefold flame within our hearts. Let the light of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, beloved Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, as the burning and the smoking lamp of our father Abraham now ignite a fire in the earth let the fire be ignited in the earth By the authority of the Almighty within me, I invoke the threefold flame within the heart for the consuming of the cause and core of all substance surrounding the chakra of the heart and all substance surrounding the solar plexus and the throat chakra. Praise for the light of God that never fails. Praise for the light of God that never fails. Praise for the light of God that never fails. Praise for the light of God that never fails. I call over the line with the valve and omega within these temples. I demand the burning up the exposure and the consuming of all demons and discarnates of dishonor and misuse of the cosmic honor flame. Please for the light of God that never fails. Please for the light of God that never fails. Please for the light of God that never fails. Please for the light. Please for the light. Please for the light. Please for the light in the name of the living word I call with the sword Excalibur with the heart of beloved El Moria. Lead up in my dear kidney with the archangel Michael. I demand the piercing and the exposure of all impurity within the desire body and all impurity within the sounding of the spoken word in the hearts of those devotees who would be representatives of the world teachers. Please for the light of God that never fails. Please for the light of God that never fails. Please for the light of God that never fails. She's the white fire presiding to the heart of the race and Hosanna, and the God will be done, and the God will be done, and the God will be done. I call for white fire and blue lightning with the heart of the race and Hosanna to descend. I call for the mighty action of the ruby ray. I demand the stripping of this force field of all that is anti-Christ, anti-Father, anti-Mother, and anti-Holy Spirit. Burn right through with the power of Helios and Mess and the reason was unmanned. Burn right through with the full power of Alpha and Omega. I am the drawing of the light of the Father and the Mother for the birth of the Emmanuel within each heart. I call for the birth of the Emmanuel within each heart. And I am the full power and the person of Emmanuel, God with us, for the burning and the consuming of all that is not of the light within these temples. In the name of the Father, the Mother, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Mother, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Mother, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Won't you be seated? We are commissioned by the Ancient of Days to go after the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus said that he came for that purpose. A certain life wave incarnated through Jacob. 
the grandson of Abraham, bearing the seed for the potential of the realization of the Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. These 12 tribes, through these 12 sons, are for the opening of the way of the group, karma, the mandala, of those who are determined to save the multitudes of the earth. And yet we see by their behavior that they make a severe karma in and among themselves by their rivalry and by their jealousy. The youngest son of Jacob is Joseph, the favorite son to whom the father gives the coat of many colors. He is the soul of Jesus Christ. He is betrayed by all of the eleven under the ringleader Reuben, betrayed and sold into Egypt where he rises under the king and eventually provides chastisement as well as love to his father and his brothers. The seeds of karma among these twelve persist to today. We're going to see another episode that is revealed by Isaiah in the karma that is made among these twelve. The resolution of that karma is according to the science of the cosmic clock taught to us by Mother Mary. The mention of the twelve tribes is a number of times and therefore I have listed for you four different cosmic clocks of the positioning of the twelve tribes and a listing of their chakras. These will be given to you in class this evening. Each of the four are for the four lower bodies and as they have been mentioned from Genesis to Revelation in the various uh, purposes of their mentioning which is the order of their birth and then according to their assigned position in the tabernacle of witness they are given assigned positions then they are given assignments uh, as to their positioning at the gates of the city in both Ezekiel and Revelation and they're giving given positions according to the ceiling of their foreheads. Just to review for you, the 13 tribes come of the fact that Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh were blessed by Jacob upon his deathbed and he said he made them his own sons as though they were his sons. So out of Joseph comes two and that makes 13. The 13th tribe is really the tribe of the Christed ones, the anointed ones, the priesthood. The priesthood began as the Levites, but the conclusion of the, priest, of the priesthood in our day is a remnant of all tribes, the remnant who keep the name of God, I am that I am, and who keep the law and the flame of the Christ in the heart. There are prophecies in Isaiah which the commentators on the book have no answers for. They do not understand the uh, prophecy and they say so in their commentaries. The karma is very clear. The brothers are not only jealous of the favoritism to Joseph and his sons, but also in and among one another. These tribes were dispersed, they were cast out. The ten northern tribes became called the outcasts of Israel, and the two southern tribes were called the dispersed of Judah. Ephraim and Manasseh were in the north, so that the ten northern tribes were collectively referred to as Israel, which was the name given to Jacob upon his blessing, and were called collectively also Ephraim. Recently, we gave a lecture at Summit University on a Sunday morning here in the chapel, tracing the origin and the fulfillment of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh being incarnated in Great Britain and Ephraim in the United States, the two brothers, showing and tracing that the seed of Joseph is really and truly the seed of Jesus Christ and that the English-speaking peoples upon the planetary body are the first ones to receive the Ascended Master's teachings in that Saint Germain brings forth his revelation in their language, in the English language, when he brings forth the I Am movement, 
uh, in the United States through Godfrey. So the first ones that we go to are the ones who are the English-speaking peoples in all nations. And you see how that language which descended from Atlantis and from the tongues of angels has spread throughout the world so that the children of the light, the real uh, remnant of Israel, whether they are living in the continent of Africa or throughout the colonies of England and the United States, they have the English language as their mother tongue. And so this teaching is to be carried in this very year and the coming year by you to the English-speaking peoples of the earth. And that is the assignment of Saint Germain, the prophet Samuel. We must begin with the souls who have the highest attainment. The attainment and their selection to embody uh, in nations where they would have English either by their mother tongue or by their education is not happenstance. It is not accident. It is to provide them with the means of interpretation of the word, which is what language gives. The way you speak is the way you think. People speak the way they think, they think the way they speak. When you learn a foreign language, the first thing you learn is that people think differently. Their idioms are different, the order of their sentences are different, the placement of verbs. And how they think about themselves is how they think about themselves in relationship to God. So Saint Germain has said he desired decrees to be given in English and he prefers people in of foreign languages to give fewer decrees but to master the giving of the decrees in English. There's a great resistance to this among countries that are not English speaking. They would want to give lots of decrees, they like to translate them, and they, they like to give them in their own language. Whereas Saint Germain has said, if you give the same decree over and over and over again until you give, can give another decree, it is better to give the decrees in English so that when the whole body of God comes together, wherever you go on the face of the earth, you have the decree momentum of the word and the science of the word as it was released through the guru. And Saint Germain has said that whatever is the language of your guru, you must make your own. And therefore, uh, if you're going to follow in Sanskrit, you must study Sanskrit. But if you're going to follow the Ascended Master's teachings, you must study English. Well, Ephraim and Manasseh, part of the Northern Tribe. What we are going to see outlined by Isaiah today is the rivalry coming to outright war between the Northern and the Southern Kingdoms, and finally, this war leading to uh, the exile of Israel and finally the dispersion of Judah. This is a very low point in the mission of Isaiah. I want to point out to you that when we read chapter 6 concerning Isaiah's vision, contained in that vision is a commission to Isaiah in which God tells him that though he goes and speaks to the people, they will hear and not understand they will see but perceive not. And he tells them to make the heart of this people fat and their ears heavy, let their karma descend, lest they should be converted and healed before they have actually surrendered that substance within the subconscious. It's an important point of the law. If you receive the fiery word and it is for the healing of your consciousness before you have made the free will choice to be aligned with God. It is a premature healing and it is a healing that comes before your free will has been tested, before your real ability to love God for the sake of loving him and not for what you get from him has been revealed. We see this happening in people who come to the Ascended Master's activity. They come for personal wants and personal needs and first is delivered to them their karma. Then is revealed how do they react to their karma. Do they curse God? Do they uh, clench their fists and challenge him? Or do they receive the karma, patiently work through it, and then, because they have been tested, receive the healing? So in essence, God is saying to Isaiah, even though you go forth in my name and by my word, you will see the people will not listen to you. The casting out of 
Israel and Judah will take place and the rivalry among them will result in chastisement for all and they will not heed and my outstretched hand will remain upon them as the judgment they will not repent and therefore I will not send forgiveness so it is a very hard saying that Isaiah brings Isaiah does not measure his willingness to go forward in the name of Yahweh on the basis of Yahweh predicting that he will be a success. And this is a very important point for each one of you. If you go out to represent the world teachers because you feel you have a certain success, that your success is guaranteed, then you do not understand the real mission of the prophet. The prophet holds the pillar of fire. He is the mediator between God and the king, God and the priest, God and the people. He tells the truth. He speaks the truth. He challenges unrighteousness. He exposes it. But he is not attached to the reaction whether the people react favorably or unfavorably, he is all consumed by the sacred fire. He will be that pillar in and among them. He will be the point through which their judgment and their karma descends one way or the other. So the seeking of popularity or the idea that you're, you are on the winning team and therefore you can't fail. Failing or succeeding is not a part of the lexicon of the ascended masters. The victory is the fulfillment of the divine plan. And the divine plan was for Isaiah to speak the truth, even though God saw that this group of individuals, these tribes of Israel, were not ready to relinquish their sin. They had not had enough of their karma returned to them. They even were able to look at impending disaster and explain it by natural causes. They had not reached the point where, not through superstition, but through faith itself, they could understand that all events that took place in Israel and Judah were because of the presence of the Lord. We see this happening in the United States today. We have fire, we have flood, we have inordinate weather conditions, and people seek to explain it either by natural causes or by manipulations of China or the Soviet Union with our weather. We see Skylab and everyone excited and worried about where is Skylab going to land. Well, obviously, if the Lord God is in Israel today, that Skylab is not going to descend upon his people unless he allows it as an instrument of their judgment. But I was always confident that Skylab would land in the ocean. Where else would the Holy Spirit have it land? except desert and ocean, which is where it landed, in the Australian desert and in the ocean. But the people in America today do not figure things from the base of God's intercession. They have a God of material science, and this is the explanation for events, which effectively neutralizes the experience of the chastening hand of God. So the hand of God is outstretched over America today. In other words, the judgment descends from the hand. And the hand is not withdrawn because when the judgment descends, the people do not relent in their evil doing. With all of this bad weather, which Zadkiel told us was the result of abortion in this country, the people made no connection whatsoever between their sin and the resulting weather cataclysms. So it is the work of the prophet, the chila, the devotee, the representative in the midst of the people to say, look, this is why this has come upon you. This is your karma because you have done this, this, and this. Repent from your ways. Some will hear, some will not. But God even agreed to save Sodom if there were ten righteous men in the city and ten righteous men could not be found and so the city was destroyed. It would be interesting to determine the population of Sodom and Gomorrah and to discover what ten individuals, what percentage of that population was. We might begin to figure out our percentages today. But we will not do that because God has said our strength is not in our numbers. But I am truly convinced, because it is prophecy, that a remnant is sufficient. So let us see how this karma comes to pass, how the 12 tribes make their karma, 
how they make it again and again in their subsequent embodiments. They do not relent because of the return of karma, so their rivalries against one another devastate themselves. In addition to their own internal rivalries, the neighboring tribes are used against them. Now when we gave to you the interpretation of chapter 5 about the hissing from the end of the earth and the, the return of karma coming swiftly, I gave you a level of the understanding of these verses that was the understanding of the coming of the hosts of the Lord, their word, their sound. And this intensity coming upon the rebellious generation as a return of karma, as a judgment. You can see all of that which happens. You can interpret that this army that comes to deliver the judgment to the warring tribes, its description shall not be weary nor stumble among them, shall not slumber or sleep. The arrows are sharp, the horses who shall be counted like flint and so forth. Their roaring shall be like a lion. You can interpret that at the physical level as a neighboring army of superior intensity, in that case Assyria. You can see the Lord's deliverance of his judgment not because he uses evil or the fallen ones to tempt us, but that he allows them to go ahead with their plans of conquest because it happens to be the karma of the people themselves who have left themselves vulnerable. So you can see Assyria, which the Brotherhood has uh, described and likened to world communism. You can see Babylon, which the Brotherhood has likened to the international uh, multinational corporations and the international bankers. Babylon, the archetype of greed, sensuality, decadence, Assyria, the archetype of intense cruelty, mighty armies, and uh, destruction. So Assyria and the Assyrians come and they do utterly destroy. And so you see that at the physical level, the instrumentation of Assyria against these 12 tribes who have not listened. At the high spiritual level, you can see the hosts of the Lord delivering judgment as the white fire and the remnant holding and being the ones who are strong. Now we are in chapter 7. We realize that no matter what God has told Isaiah concerning the outcome, he is there to deliver his message. I would like to tell you that you must not compromise your message, especially on radio and television. Do not compromise the fiery word because you are speaking in my behalf you're speaking of the messenger and you're saying the ascended masters teach us through Elizabeth Clare Prophet that abortion is first degree murder of God. Not that abortion is simply wrong. You have to go all the way and deliver the whole message when you are speaking in my name. When you are giving uh, a lecture on abortion to a secular group as a private person following the admonishment of the masters to become qualified as public speakers when you're going here and there you give the abortion message the way it is given by the people who are pro-life you're part you're representing the pro-life movement and then when you are speaking to people who are more interested who may talk to you privately you may deliver to them the esoteric truths so you have to understand from what position you speak. And if you use my name, you should give the full message and not try to water me down or soften me down because I am there with you and I am there standing with you to protect you and by God's grace from the reaction. So the same will be true on other messages that you deliver on subliminal seduction, the implanting of suggestions and hypnotic symbols within advertising, uh, when you speak on the exposure in education of the textbooks. These are secular lectures you should be giving to secular audiences. And you do not have to reveal your position. You are uniting as a citizen of the United States in the defense of moral integrity in our country. And you are one with them at their level of the delivery of the word. And that's a very important exercise for you to have. The same in working with political parties. You don't have to feel burdened by delivering the full Ascended Master's message in those situations. Please understand the difference. 
there's a big difference. And I don't want you to feel burdened uh, to represent this organization when that does not happen to be what you are doing. But to give the Ascended Masters teachings and not give their origin is a, is a terrible thing to do. To give the Ascended Masters teachings, to lead people in meditations, to talk about Mother Mary or Archangel Raphael, and yet not to distribute the books and not to give a person an opportunity to go to the local teaching center or the study group. This is an absolute abuse of the word. I'm speaking of that because there has been an individual in this group who is no longer here who actually does that who is in open criticism of one of our teaching centers and refuses to lead people to the fount but makes herself the fount and gives people a watered down version of the teaching on the excuse while they can't take any more. This is, this is too high. So I think you should understand that when you speak in the name of the Lord you have to give credit to the Lord and the Lord is the entire chain of guru. When you're speaking on behalf of the people as a citizen in a secular situation and not trying to present yourself as a religious authority, you speak at the level that they can understand. And that is not compromise. You have a secular role, you have a spiritual role. Sometimes they are together, as we are together with one harmony and understanding. Sometimes they are entirely separate. Now for me, I could not do that, you see. I cannot go and give a secular lecture on abortion. I'm like Isaiah, I'm here, and when I speak I have to give the whole truth. Like it or not, the world can take me or leave me, but I can't be in a position of compromise. And that is why I send you, because you can be in a secular position. I can never do that. I can never withhold any particle of the full complement of the law. You take the book on abortion that was published by Ralph Yaney. He is speaking to a secular audience. He could pick and choose what he wanted to put in that book and he left out some of the more burning and scorching denunciations of abortion or downplayed them by putting them in the appendix. Well, if I write a book, I can't write a book and put the Ascended Master's teachings as an appendix as though they were lesser in importance to a text that I might write. If I write a book on abortion, I have to deliver the fiery judgment of Almighty God on it because that is my office. So you have another office, and your office is to understand the difference between the spirit and the matter bowl and don't confuse them. So here is Isaiah never confusing his role. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved, and the heart of the, his people, as the trees of the wood, are moved with the wind. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Incidentally, this son of Isaiah is one of two sons, and this son, his name means a remnant shall return. A remnant shall return. Isaiah names him for the promise that the Lord gives him that though you may fail in this hour, ultimately a remnant shall return. Now it is the office of the prophet to be the tester of souls. You, without realizing it, will become the tester of men's souls by the very portion of the flame of the prophet that you will bear. You will speak a word and it will turn people to the right or to the left. And many times you have no idea that the word that you speak will be an offense to them, to their particular position. I often find that I'm the greatest tester when I have no idea that what I'm going to be saying, someone is going to take an exception to. That someone often turns out to be a chila. 
Sometimes you think that people are so devoted that you can give them any assignment and they will take it and all of a sudden you discover that uh, they are quite infuriated because they are given some assignment that they are not willing to take. And this I find that God always knows and he hides from me so that he makes me an effective nonpartisan instrument because Sometimes when I know that people have weaknesses, I will plead with God to not send me on this mission for the testing of their souls. And so sometimes God becomes angry or impatient with me and says, go to and carry out my word. In the past, I think it was about six months ago, God gave me a word to deliver to someone. It took me all of 48 hours to determine that I was going to give this discipline to this soul. And it was well received and gratefully received, but it was very severe. And I was the one who went through the agony of standing as mediator between this absolute certain word of God, which I knew I was going to deliver. It wasn't as though I was arguing with God, but I was somehow kept waiting for a riper moment. <laughs> Well, after 48 hours, there was no other moment but now. And I found the soul very receptive, very grateful, and learned a great lesson through that discipline. This is something that Mark Prophet taught me. I saw him being willing to wrestle with a carnal mind of an individual so that the soul could be liberated and walk in a higher way of consciousness. It's very important to love people enough to be the Lord's instrument without fearing their reaction to your personality. In other words, don't make popularity your goal in leadership. Leaders, good leaders, are seldom that popular in their time. They are appreciated for the effects of the causes they set in motion. And those causes are so intense that usually the immediate reaction is, is that the, the leader is too intense, too severe, um, you know, too straight-laced, too absolute, whatever you want to call it, the intensity of the energy that is necessary to galvanize and get people going and get a mission accomplished is initially rebelled against because it's always at a notch higher than the attainment of the people to whom the leader is speaking. The leader wouldn't be leader if he weren't a few notches above the people. So. Obviously, his message is going to challenge and summon the best forces of a group of people to higher action. And if you are only capable of leading people at the level where they are, it's just like leading cattle around in a circle all day long. Uh, if, they, if they were in a good place where you find them, they wouldn't need a leader. So a leader is a galvanizer of the best forces. When the best forces come out of the individual, the worst forces are challenged and that is the awakening of the serpent and the fighting back of the, the anti-substance, the anti-matter, just plain sloth in, in an individual who is really dedicated, really sincere, really wants to do what has to be done, but for the moment needs someone to hold that balance of fiery energy so that he will keep in line and do what he really wants to do. So a leader is there to lead the people to do what they really want to do which is gain the victory for God. So here comes Isaiah to be the tester, and he is testing the king. Now you must never feel that anyone, however high and mighty or however lowly, is somehow more important than God or the chila or the prophet. Now I've had people come to me highly impressed with people's position, their attainment, their degrees, their experience, their this, their that, and tell me how indispensable they are because of their attainment. And I'll say, what attainment? And then they'll list me all these outer accomplishments. And I will say, look, that individual has a minus attainment when it comes to faith in God and following in obedience his word. And all of this outer experience, not done to the glory of God, but, the, but to the glory of the personal ego, is a liability. It's an intense liability because the more that an individual has of this without God, the more sufficient and independent he feels from God. 
The more money he can earn, the more he knows about this universe, the more he accelerates above the mass consciousness, the more an individual will feel secure outside of God. The false security of the carnal mind. So it becomes a liability. Now education and professional skills are an immense attainment when and only when they are laid upon the altar of God. And until they are done to the glory of God, they are chaff. And you need to be hard-nosed about this because people will come and impress you with how important they are and how much you need them in order to succeed in the Summit Lighthouse and succeed with your mission. For some reason, St. Germain, after much calling from myself, placed me in a job in the United Nations when I was 19 working for the delegate's private photographer, and he saw to it that I met hundreds and hundreds of delegates, ambassadors and representatives from all over the world every day as I was there to show them the latest pictures taken of them on the floor of the General Assembly, the Security Council, their private meetings, their, their receptions, and so forth. So I had to know everyone individually, hundreds of people, memorize their names and faces, match them with their photographs, of which I had stacks in my files. And the moment they appeared at my desk, I had to look at the face, remember the face, pull it out and say, here you are, Mr. Ambassador. Here's this beautiful picture of you taken and that you can send home and publish in your home newspaper. Well, I can assure you that I was in a panic most of the time that I worked there because these foreign names and these faces and hundreds of them all descending upon me at once and demanding their pictures as they would come out of their meetings. Well, what I learned in that experience was that no matter who a person is, no matter what his great exalted position in the world, no matter where he has come from, no matter what is behind him in wealth or power or position, that the individual is still a man or a woman like me or like you. And I learned that the greatest men and women are the most humble, no matter where they are in government or in church. And I learned that the people who are truly great and truly humble will deal with you and with me on a one-to-one -one basis of equality, not of attainment, but of opportunity that here is a fellow man, a fellow woman, a soul with equal opportunity to make it in life. Now the fallen ones, the watchers, the seed of the wicked do not have this attitude. They are pompous, proud, they talk down the nose at you, they're demanding, commanding, uh, ruthless, cruel, opportunists, and so forth. And they definitely make the little people, the children of God, feel that they are of no value, no worth, and have no standing and are not capable of occupying positions of rulership. Now you find that constantly among these fallen ones until the entire vibration of world condemnation upon God's little people is such that they have in fact accepted the lie, surrendered, and do not take positions of leadership. I had enough esteem in those days, enough awareness of the I Am Presence within me. I had, by that time, had the books for about a year. And I knew who I was, and I knew that no one there was better than I was. And I learned it by watching the behavior, sometimes extremely abominable, of these individuals. And when I saw what was happening behind the scenes at the UN, immense corruption and sensuality, I knew for a certainty that God was not going to save the world through the United Nations. <laughs> now, that may seem obvious to you today, but I was 19. I had grown up on the East Coast. My indoctrination was from the liberal establishment. I went to Eastern schools. I learned political science the way it is taught today by the left wing. And I had every reason to believe that the UN was the hope of the world because from the time we were little children through college, this was presented to us. And it was Saint Germain and not anyone in the outer who revealed to me that indeed the UN was not the hope of the world. And so I was grateful for the first-hand experience. 
because I saw one by one and then collectively as a body, these individuals were not capable of solving the world's problems. Now, I'm sure I didn't get that out of my own head because I think such an immense conclusion for having been there three months could only come by the Holy Spirit. Well, you have to experience this leveling process that no man or woman is anything until he is obedient to Almighty God. No man or woman is anything. They do not count whether they be kings or princes or what. Whether they be wearing the cloth and they be ministers, they do not count until they have surrendered their soul on the altar of Almighty God and said, Here am I, send me. And I don't care what illusions they give to their, their pomposity and their standing and their authority or how many years they have held a, a position in a university or in a big church or sitting there as cardinals or whatever they are. If in their hearts they are not pure, they have no standing in the kingdom of God. And you need to understand that first about yourself and then about everyone whom you meet. And not have pride and say, I am a tester of evil men's souls. No. You must have that immense confidence that God is working through you and that you are not appearing with a mantle of God upon you because you are righteous or unrighteous, but because of the set of your sail and the motive of your heart. The set of the sail is which way the wind's blowing. If you're moving with the wind of the Holy Spirit, but you make a mistake, you still have the mantle of God upon you. And if your heart is pure and you make a mistake, the mantle of God remains. But if you are corrupt in your motive and corrupt in your attitude and internally and subconsciously rebellious and you go against the wind of the Holy Spirit, then you do not have the mantle of God with you. And you will find that out very quickly. So remember, it is not that I am righteous or unrighteous that I stand before you with this mantle. And you must know that God does not judge you by the measure of your sin or your absence of sin. He measures you by the motive of your heart and when your heart is cleansed and your mind is enlightened, your body conforms to deeds that are honorable. And so once you are enlightened, you have less excuse for sin and disobedience and you cannot continually flaunt the law. But the day you step on the threshold of the Ascended Master's teachings, not I, not I will ever examine what you have done before and tell you you do not qualify because of your past deeds. But once you take up the teaching and you misuse it, you can expect chastisement and discipline. And if you do so continually and continually, you finally find that people are exposed for the impurity of their motive, their stubbornness, and they're moving against the will of God. These are the opportunists. These are the goats who come among the sheep. And no such people will be disciplined or cast out on the first instance. I am a person who can forgive anyone of anything as long as that person repents. I have a full heart of immense forgiveness, tolerance, and understanding. But when month after month and year after year you see people take forgiveness as an excuse to take advantage of God, you find that the hand of God in the person of El Moria descends. And when it descends, it is swift and sudden. And I see this happening, and I cannot stand in the way of that hand, because if I do, it will descend upon me. I want to make it very clear, and I'm speaking to situations that are happening right now, today, and yesterday. The fallen ones will point the accusing finger to the sins of the righteous. In other words, they will take the children of the light who are trying and they will point to mistakes they make and say, aha, see, he's fallen just like us and we delight in it. And this delight in the mistakes of the children of God is taken by the seed of the wicked to justify their own position. 
the seed of the wicked and a child of light may perform the same sin the child of the light may be forgiven the seed of the wicked may not be because the seed of the wicked has been performing this action to trap and to tempt the children of the light for generations and when his karma falls it falls and it falls as the judgment the child of the light may experience severe karma and severe chastisement but he does not lose his heirship as a child of God he does not lose his right to ultimately come and claim his sonship there is a great difference here so not by the sin or the absence of the sin does the judgment or the karma come but by the path of initiation that is known best by the ascended masters so when you are an instrument of the testing of souls you are not so much the judge as you are the mediator of the word and the word of God is the person of the son when the son in you is the mediator of the word and that word goes forth it becomes the judgment in and of itself independent of you so here is Isaiah in this position before Ahaz and God is telling him to take his son and to meet Ahaz at a certain point of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field. Now, historians say there were about 4,000 people living here at this time, and that Isaiah would well know when Ahaz was passing through. And so God is instructing him as to what he's going to say to Ahaz. Now this instruction of God as to what the prophet is to do, I watched and watched and watched this would occur with Mark Prophet. It occurs with me. When God is going to deliver his teaching, his chastisement, his judgment, his exposure, his enlightenment, he gives specific words and teachings, very precise, for that occasion to deal with that particular circumstance and sin. So God is talking with Isaiah, preparing him. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of resin with Syria and of the son of Ramalia, because Syria Ephraim and the son of Ramalia have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tobiel. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son. If we if ye will not believe surely ye shall not be established God is telling Ahaz who is the king of Judah the southern kingdom don't be afraid of the attack of Ephraim allied with Syria allied with these forces if you will trust in me you will be protected and if you do not believe me you will not be established you will not be kept so with all of this mounting of the warring of the tribes against one another and the joining of the tribes by neighboring forces to conquer the heart to conquer the heart of Jerusalem the heart of Judah the heart chakra of the whole 12 tribes is at stake here and Ahaz is being tested by Isaiah to see if he will stand by faith in Yahweh Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Now this is what Isaiah is told to say to him. Isaiah stands right before him and says, Now God is saying this to you. He's promising to deliver Judah. Go ahead and ask him for a sign that he will prove himself, either a sign from heaven or a sign from the earth whatever you ask for God will give you the sign as proof of my word 
But here is Ahaz's reply, and it's a political reply. He is quoting scripture to defend a position that he wants to maintain, which is a position of political compromise. Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Now it is written in scripture that man shall not tempt the Lord. And the people of Israel were rebuked when they tempted the Lord and they told Moses to strike the rock and to bring forth water. They demanded water, they wanted a sign from God, and Moses became angry and struck the rock. And there was a karma upon both of them for that deed. So he quotes scripture and says, no, I will not tempt God. But here is God standing before him in the person of the prophet, ready to give him the sign and the revelation, telling him to ask for a sign. So it is neither asking for a sign nor not asking for a sign that becomes the evil, but the motive of the heart and the set of the sail. Remember this, the set of the sail, the sail is your soul. The soul and the third eye are the air chakras, the wind of the Holy Spirit. Is it moving in your soul and therefore are you asking for a sign from God because you are about to embark upon a great mission and you desire in the purity of your heart his blessing, his confirmation that you truly are walking in his name. Jesus said, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given save the sign of the prophet Jonas. And his sign was that he was three days in the belly of the whale and he came forth. And the sign given of the sparing of Nineveh because they repented. The sign was the sign of Jesus being buried in the tomb of the mother, the whale, the symbol of the mother. So, when a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign because their motive is impure, they want God to put the firebrand of his stamp upon their actions. But God will not do so because the set of their sail is not right and their hearts are not pure. So remember this, when you are moving in representing God, God will show you signs that you do not ask for, and when you ask for them, he may, ever gi he may either give you a sign or not give you a sign. But be careful. I have seen people hear the answer from my own lips or from a dictation of the ascended masters. I have given them the way, the teaching, the answer, and what they are to do. And they will go forth and doubt and fear and wonder and ask for a sign. That shows you that the motive is impure when God speaks to them directly and they cannot accept it. They want some kind of psychic perception that is going to confirm what they really want to do themselves. People are forever doing this. It becomes very dangerous. Sometimes I wonder whether I should answer people when they ask me, what is the will of God? And I have learned that I should say, what is your will? Because un unless people know what their will is, they may be wholly unaccepting of the will of God. So you need to learn to define what is the most you're going to lay on the altar, and that becomes the most of the will of God that you can handle. When I find out what you're willing to lay upon the altar as an act of service, then I say, all right, go and do that service, because that is what you're able, ready, and willing to do. So by our ability to define our deeds and our actions, we often carve out a segment of God's will for us. There are others, able-bodied, strong, and willing, and they come and they say, I can do any of these ten things and I'll do any one you ask me to do. There is less personal preference involved. There's not already a plan laid out where they say, this is what I'm going to do, don't you think it's a good idea? So there's a difference. And here is Ahaz. He has his own purposes. He has made up his mind. He's going to fight this war in his own way. He's not going to listen to this revolutionary Isaiah. And so Isaiah will not be turned back. If Ahaz does not ask for a sign, he's going to address the whole city of Jerusalem. 
He's going to speak to the whole group of them and he's going to say, in the face of war and antichrist opposition to the very heart of this nation, here is the sign. So he says, hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? Ahaz is wearying men with his impiety. Will he now also weary God? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. God is going to give you this sign whether you've asked for it or not because I'm standing here, I'm the prophet, it's my mission today to give you this sign, take it or leave it, here is the sign. Ahaz has to listen, everybody who's watching this encounter in the street is going to listen, here it is. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Imagine this. Can you imagine this? They're just about to be attacked by invading armies. <laughs> Can you imagine yourself standing on the steps of the White House, testing the President of the United States when an alert has been given that we're about to go into nuclear war, and you stand there and you say, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This takes courage. <laughs> Extraordinary courage. And it only comes from total integration with God being. Saint Germain says, come to the altar the way you are. Sinner, psychological problems, past deeds that you're ashamed of, an absence of education, Whatever you think is so terribly wrong with you, the day the Lord releases that light on your heart, come, come to the altar the way you are. Be healed, be revealed, have your substance exposed, go through the understanding of what is the study of your soul, what makes you tick, why does your watch tick out of tune or out of time? What are those subconscious substances? Put them in the flame, tarry in the white fire core until you really know what you are. You know what your weaknesses are. You know what kind of friends you need to be around to reinforce your strengths when your weaknesses come up. That's what a community is for. That is what friends are for. That's why you need to be a part of community. So you can really find out why you made those mistakes. So that under fire and pressure, when you're out in the world again, you won't go down in the same trap and do it all over again. The why of the sin is what God is interested in. Did you sin because you sincerely thought that through that sin of taking drugs or this or that experiment with energy, you were going to attain a higher consciousness to help his people? Well, God has mercy upon you. He does not condemn you. He shows you a higher way. And by the motive of your heart, you are led to the place where you can learn the higher way. Now, if you take drugs to commit suicide, to abrogate your responsibilities to life, and you enjoy sucking little children into the practice of drugs, you become a dealer, and you gain some kind of devilish glee in watching people destroy themselves, well, if you happen to be a child of God and you did all that, you also should come to the altar and have the whole thing exposed and ripped and stripped from you so that you can go through your immense period of weeping and soul searching and soul purging and asking for forgiveness and truly be penitent and find that God can renew in you the new man and the new heart and give you the opportunity to save those souls that you've led astray. In other words, it's possible for Saul to be contacted who persecutes and allows the murder of Christians to be wholly converted and become Paul, the apostle. But the fallen ones tell people you've sinned so bad you'll never make it. And they're the ones that got you to sin in the first place. So you come to the altar, you get taken apart and put back together again, and you walk in the footsteps 
of, of Isaiah. You walk in the footsteps of Isaiah, in the shadow of his mantle, and your courage to stand and proclaim this truth is because of the, the entire succession of the prophets have done it before you. Now it's interesting in the commentaries on this prophecy that some scholars, and you know there are liberal scholars and conservative scholars, the most fundamental scholars insist that this is the prophecy of the birth of Jesus Christ because all roads must lead to Jesus Christ. Because if they don't, their whole theory collapses. The liberal scholars will say because of, of dates, historical facts, surrounding verses and information, this could not possibly be interpreted as the coming of either Jesus Christ, the second son of Isaiah, or the next king, Hezekiah. And so they will admit that they are in a quandary as to what is this prophecy that is being given because it is an imminent prophecy. It's a prophecy that's a solution for right now this impending disaster. So what is the solution? It's a tremendous solution. A virgin shall conceive. A virgin is a person who has the sealing of the aura in the balance of the light of the Father, Mother, God. It's like it's androgynous being. It is wholeness. It's the universal mother, the virgin who shall conceive and bear a son. The son is in you, Ahaz. Every one of you, children of Jerusalem, who stand threatened today, the son conceived is the man-child, the indwelling God with us, Emmanuel, in the heart. Allow the divine woman to come into you, to unite with the I Am Presence, and to be the cradle and the womb of the birth of this Christ consciousness in you. And by that Christ consciousness, Ahaz, you will defeat those who are not whole, who have an absence of the wholeness of God. This is the absolute message to America today. The twelfth chapter of the book of Revelation. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, a crown of twelve stars, and the moon under her feet. And she gives birth to the man-child. The identical vision to John was given to Isaiah. It's the only way out of your karma, your rivalries, your warring, your foreign alliances. Isaiah challenged Ahaz and told him, don't align yourselves with foreign powers. Don't seek protection with foreign powers. You will only end in corruption. So here is the message, the coming revolution in higher consciousness. This is the message. Unless this child be born in you, there is no salvation. This is the fiery core of it. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Mystical writing, the alchemical substances of butter and honey, it is like eating of the discriminating faculty of the fruit of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because this man-child may take that fruit, may take and receive the initiation from Lord Maitreya. What he eats is what he assimilates from the Guru Maitreya, from the Guru the Ancient of Days, what he assimilates of the body and blood of Christ, the Holy Communion, will enable him to refuse the evil and choose the good. Parents and teachers, it is this body and blood of Christ as the teaching of the ascended masters that we must feed our children so that they know good from evil and have the strength to refuse the evil and choose the good when we are no longer with them and they are alone on the shore of life and must make their decision to align themselves with the mighty I Am Presence or with the world. How can we apart the butter and the honey when we have not assimilated it? That is why we are here. We must assimilate this bread and wine of the living Christ. He will eat it. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest 
shall be forsaken of both her kings. This is the prediction now of an impending invasion of Judah, which is also repeated in 2 Chronicles 28, verses 1 to 20. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. From the day of the separation from the day of the acknowledgement of the division of the tribes and the northern and the southern kingdom, you have not known what will come upon thee. It's like this is the introduction of the dark cycle in this phase of the 12 tribes experience, the dark cycle not repeated again until this very century. We've had a series of dark cycles in our history. This is one that has not ever been so dark since the separation. Now there was a dark cycle of the flood of Noah and the sinking of Atlantis. There are periodic releases of very intense karma. We are in one of them. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they shall come. This denotes that the Lord calls. He sounds the tone. The children of the light are not in vibration with that word that goes forth. And so it becomes a sounding of the tone that allows the descent of the karma through the neighboring enemies. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. None shall escape this karma. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it shall all consume the beard. The shaving of the children of Israel, the stripping of them of the substance which they have misqualified. Misqualified energy accumulated in the chakras and in the aura becomes a defense against returning karma. People manipulate their misqualified substance. Yes, they are very dense with it, but in their density, they are manipulative. You can look at very dense people in the world and they have power. What is their power? It's the power of the world, and the power of the world is misqualified energy. The more energy they misqualify, the more energy piles up in their aura as substance untransmuted, but they learn to use that energy and direct it against the light. And so here you find the science of karma dodging. It is practiced by the fallen ones and is practiced by the laggards, the children of the light, and it is practiced by the children of the light who go against the Ancient of Days. So they build up all this energy in their force field. They learn to manipulate it. The use of cursing, mortal cursing, is a way to manipulate energy through the throat chakra. And through their misqualified energy, they have discarnates and demons which also reinforce whatever they are doing against the light. So by the habits that they are involved in, by all of the various practices, whether it's alcohol or drugs or, or heavy eating or lying or cheating or stealing, they are building up this enormous force field and the karma of those individuals does not return as swiftly as the karma of the initiate on the path. Why? The initiate of, on the path has gone out the farthest distance from the sun that he's going to do, that he's going to go. He has a conversion. He turns around, the meaning of conversion, he turns around and he starts following his own path back to the sun. So he's in the state of the harvest. We are all harvesting. We're harvesting our good works and our not so good works, our good and bad karma. And as we go, we are wholly dependent on the Lord God Almighty to sustain us. We have renewed our covenant. We're willing to submit to the law of that karma and the law of the violet flame and put it in the flame and get it transmuted as fast as possible so we can be a better instrument for God. So we meet adversity. And when we sin, God chastises us instantly. Instant karma. Now you look at this other sort of people who have built up in their auras all this substance. They're still walking away from the sun. 
They're still walking away from the sun. So they're walking in their own shadow. They're walking in their own shadow. So when they sin, they just accumulate more karma. They're still sowing. Now what is going to happen for those people to reap their karma? They have to be shaved with the edge of the razor that is hired. A razor that is hired. God didn't use the Christ incarnate to shave them. He hired the neighboring Assyrians. He let them, he allowed them to be the instruments of the shaving of their ill-gotten gains, their misqualified energy, their false attainment. Now when you make calls on individuals who are exceedingly corrupt and wicked and whom you know to be the central focus and core of horrendous misdeeds against the children of God, people who are at the core of the mafia or the core of, of uh, rock or drugs or alcohol or the industries or the key people in the international power play scene. What do you find? You find fallen ones who are heaped upon with substance and darkness. They have reinforcing hordes of demons and entities. You have reinforcing angels of light and Archangel Michael's legions assigned to you. They have legions of demons and entities. And even fallen angels attend them. They are attended by fallen angels. I have worked on conditions such as this in this very week. And Sanat Kumara has said to me, when I have worked on certain recalcitrant individuals and their seemingly free hand to wreak havoc with our nation, El Moria has said, make the call for the binding of their demons, the binding of their entities, and the binding of their fallen angels that support their nefarious deeds. Call for them to be stripped of their ill-gotten gains, their misqualified energy, because the Ancient of Days has given the decree, to them that have not shall be taken that which they have. To those who do not have light, there shall be taken from them the light they have misqualified. To them that have not shall be taken that which they have. That's the meaning of that mystery. And the corollary statement, to those that have, shall more be added unto. To those who have light, they shall increase in light. So that is the initiation that Jesus Christ went through. Jesus is stripped of his garments. It is the tenth station of the cross. It falls on the nine o'clock line of the Holy Spirit. It is the initiation of the Holy Spirit. And if you are going to invoke it for the seed of the wicked, don't be surprised when it comes down upon your house. It came to Job. Everything was taken from him to test his loyalty to God. When he proved it, everything was given back to him again. So the stripping of the garments of Jesus Christ, he stands naked. That means your soul is naked, standing on its own attainment, nothing else supporting it. Not an ascended master or, or an angel was allowed to support Jesus. He was stripped of his garments, and all they could strip him of was the robe that he wore. He had so great light, so great attainment, he was wearing his seamless garment, that they could not in any way move him. But because he went through that initiation, because you are willing to be stripped of anything that you possess in any of your four lower bodies that you did not get by the cosmic honor flame, any misqualified energy, any accumulations whatsoever, if you didn't accumulate it for the pure purpose of the glory of God, and the service of humanity, it may very well be taken from you. If you are hoarding goods, they may be stolen from you because you did not get, dedicate them really in your feeling body to the light of God. Or your house may burn down just to test your reaction. Your heart may be totally pure, the set of your sail may be right, but your house may burn down just for that final testing of the metal of the man. Are you really ready? Are you really ready? So the tests come. If you can take them, you can dish them out. But if you're going to dish them out, you've got to be willing to take it. And if you're going to call for this initiation of the stripping of the garments, let them be stripped of their garments, it will come to you because the law is impartial. 
So in the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head, all misuse of the crown chakra, the third eye, the throat, the feet, which is the Pisces, and the feet, of course, stand upon the Aquarius and upon the uh, Sagittarius, the Capricorn, and all of those signs that pertain to the lower portions of the body. And it shall also consume the beard, which covers the chakra of the heart. So basically, they are going to be shaved of all misqualified energies of their total being. From their head to their toes, they will have stripped from them that which they and their pride had thought to be the foundations of their life and these are not truly foundation no other foundation is the foundation than that which is laid the chief cornerstone the Christ Jesus Christ the Emmanuel the son that is to be born in you there is no other foundation to life and all karma all experience on earth teaches us this equation Whatever th you think you're getting or getting ahead in, if you don't get it through that man, through that door, through that heart, in the name of God, it will be taken from you. Naked you came into the world, naked you, re re you leave from dust to dust. And the only thing that you take with you is the light of real attainment. And everything else is a liability because the ill-gotten gain returns with you as misqualified energy. You embody again and you still have to go through those trials. So there's the prophecy. Isaiah is explaining it. They all understand it. They're hearing him. But so the prophecy goes. It shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. And it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land. Whoever is left in the land, whoever remains, is going to eat what the man-child eats. He's going to have the alchemy and the sustenance of the body and blood of Christ. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silverlings, it shall even be for briars and thorns. With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all the hills that shall be digged with the mattock, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll, and write in it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz. And that is the name of his second son, which means, Haste ye, haste ye to the spoils. So the two functions of the sons of Isaiah, the one contains the promise of the remnant returning, the one saying, haste ye to the spoils, which means hasten you to seize that misqualified energy and put it into the sacred fire. Hasten the transmutation. Seize the light, send it to the great central sun, the misqualified light, let it be returned, and let light be added unto you. And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jerah, Jeberachiah. And I went unto the prophetess. The prophetess is the wife of Isaiah. And she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. The Lord spake also unto me, saying, For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in Rezin and Ramalia's son, now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. God assigns the habitations to the tribes of the earth, the nations, the seed of light, and the seed of the wicked. Now he gives the prediction that because the people have not accepted the water of life, 
so Assyria will come up over the water, exceed his bounds, and he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land. O Emmanuel. O Emmanuel. Isaiah is speaking collectively to this people who should be conceiving of that indwelling Christ and have no conception of what Isaiah is speaking of. It's like a crying out to the Christ in all as one Christ, one presence. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. The intensity of the delivery of the word, the breaking in pieces, must precede the resurrection. Gird yourselves together. You're going to be broken and broken down for Christ to be born in you. One way or another, I will have you, thus saith the Lord. America, come into alignment by this teaching of the ascended masters, or I will send from afar the nations of Russia and China to devour and demolish you until finally you will bend the knee and ask for forgiveness and repent, and until you do so, I will not spare the chastisement of the Holy Spirit nor the descent of your karma. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. God is with us, another way to say Emmanuel. You will notice that Carter and his men make decisions, they plan, they say they're going to do this and that, and again and again, these great moves that are supposed to be great accomplishments, they come to naught, they come to naught, they come to naught. Here is supposedly a Bible-quoting, God-fearing Christian at the head of this nation. He is unclean to the core. The set of his sail is against God and his people. His heart is not pure. Doesn't matter what words he repeats. Doesn't matter what he tries to do. It shall not stand. It shall not stand. For God is with us. And the God is with us is the embodied God in the person of Isaiah, in the person of the prophet, the messenger, and the witnesses, and the saints, and the chilas. God is with us because some of the remnant have recognized the indwelling Emmanuel. That is why God can bring his judgment selectively. Understand selective judgment. When there are no righteous men and women in embodiment, when all have forsaken the Christ and God is nowhere in the matter temple, he utterly destroys. He destroys a planet, he sinks a continent totally, destroys a whole city, destroys nations. But when there are those in embodiment who give devotion to the light, there is selective judgment. The seed of the wicked are harvested, are removed, and the children of the light are set free to go on. The great divine director in the karmic board has given us two alternatives. Either the remnant rise up now, take this teaching, receive its fire, spread it to the uttermost corners of the earth, and therefore establish that light, or the judgment cannot be selective. It will come down totally and utterly in that mass destruction which was upon Maldek. Will that be a denial of the fulfillment of the prophecy of the golden age? No. The souls of light rise to the etheric plane and there in the etheric plane they experience the golden age. Just because God has predicted the saving of the earth does not mean it is guaranteed in the physical until you, you yourself ratify that promise, until you make the promise yourself and act upon it. The victory is not certain. It is a certain matrix. Where it is to be filled is the free will of we, of us who are gathered here. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, 
Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear nor be afraid. Isaiah is warned by God to not go the way of this people who seek their strength in a foreign alliance. Alliance with Red China is wrong. Alliance with Russia is wrong. And the support of the people of the, of the multinational corporations, of the watchers in every land, the doing of their work, the giving by the people of their light to the watchers, to the international bankers is wrong. They must come apart and be a separate people, be willing to be poor if you have to be poor to be separate and to be free. No matter what the price for freedom, nation by nation, the people have to pay it. And if you're going to pull the plug on the Federal Reserve System and on Wall Street, you're going to have an interim chaos and economic decline before you can build on a solid foundation. And the Son of God who can rise up and figure out an economic solution to our paper money and an economic solution to getting back on the gold standard has to meet the question of how to do this and also keep the present level of prosperity, which is a false prosperity based upon a paper money and an enormous uh, quantity of money that is absent in having any backing. Now you can't suddenly go on a standard of light and the abundant life from a synthetic economy, a synthetic civilization into a golden age. So the people who are going to save the earth are going to have to be willing to be stripped of their garments and that which they attain by the mere exchange of money on the stock market, playing and selling and buying dollars and making money off those dollars and the people the poor people of America pay the price. They pay the price for the guarantee of money to Red China so now she can be in trade with us because we need her products so much. And so we give all the money for them to buy our products and we pay the bill twice over and many times over because of the continual making of paper money. Now if you're going to solve all those problems in the world, you have to understand you need sound economic planning and you need intense violet flame, intense God consciousness, intense Christ consciousness and not a dependency emotionally or psychologically on the present course of civilization. Because when it comes tumbling down and you stand alone with a prophet, you have to know how to live off the land independent of the corruption the cancer is so corrupt that if you really go after it and you have that revolution, there is no telling whether the people of the light will hold the balance to keep all things as they were, to keep the arteries of the nation running. We're trying. We're desperately giving our dynamic decrees. We're counting on this message going forth and sweeping through and drawing up the light bearers. We're counting on the violet flame instantly being the producer of that conversion. But you have to be fireballs. You've got to be balls from the heart of Omri Tass. And when your message is hurled, it has to have the impact of sweeping up with you the souls of light who need your example. They don't need a half-baked example. They don't need a wishy-washy, doubt-filled person who's living a separate life and giving a little lecture now and then here and there that has no fire. Those lukewarm people, the book of Revelation says, Thou art neither hot nor cold, therefore I will spew thee out of my mouth. And there's nothing that God hates more than a half-baked person or a half-baked chila. And you can't do it, so don't try. Because you'll be exposed. So help me, you'll be exposed. Mori is always after those people because they breed compromise. And the compromise and the doubt and the fear passes through them in their lectures and they might as well not be lecturing. And if you have those problems in your psychology Part of you pulling this way and part of you pulling that way, it's because you need to surrender and you need to tarry a while at Camelot and come to Summit University, stay for a year, find out why you have those problems. Sometimes they're very easily resolved. When you expose them and get them out and you see those inner conflicts, they may go back to childhood or previous em embodiments, doesn't matter where they came from, they go up in the violet flame. They really go up but they need intense heat and the intense heat of the violet flame that you invoke is the heat of your devotion. It's the heat of the devotion in your own heart. If you don't have a heat going in this heart, burning on fire for the love of God, the violet flame you invoke is going to get diluted 
by your wishy-washiness before it ever hits your chakras to purge you of that substance. In fact, your inner mechanism of what wars against God within you will see to it by your own subconscious impure desire that that violet flame does not transmute what you don't want to give up. And then you wonder why you still got this habit after you went through all that novena and that decree session. It's because you really didn't want it to go. So you go through the mechanics of repeating the decrees and at the end of the 30 days or 40 days you say, see ma, I'm still like I was. I haven't changed a bit. In other words, you're supposed to get me to admit that the dynamic decrees don't work, that God doesn't work, that the Holy Spirit doesn't work. Well, it's you who don't work. That's the truth. So this alignment with foreign powers is really the alignment of the seed of the wicked. The acceptance of their word. They say, you need us. You can't get out of this mess without us. The international bankers, the corporations, and the world communists. They're all telling various segments of our population. You just can't get out of this mess without us. So give us your light and we'll give you protection. Buy protection with us because we're really the ones that are controlling the outcome on this planet. They usurp the position of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Mother. They offer to do all things that the four persons of the deity do and they will do them for you. But just give us your light. And we give our light in the form of money. The money in your hand is your light because it's the sweat of your brow. It's the product of your sacred labor. You go out and work a couple weeks, you make a couple hundred dollars. That money in your hand represents the input of your light into that project. And look what happens to it. I mean, it get car gets carved up in taxes and insurance and this payment, that payment. The whole structure of our society is to make it so everything you earn is to go out again to pay for your own existence. But God doesn't have it that way. God has planned an abundant life, abundance and in full measure. But when you start giving it away to the seed of the wicked and allowing them to take it from you, you usurp your right to get that abundant life from God. Every time you give it away, you get less and less. You have financial problems, they go right back to the whole seat of our economy. We're all in that mess and in that karma because there's such a bungling of the light in our hands and it's not properly protected. You need to call not only for the protection of the economy, but of your light in manifestation as your money. Money needs protection, it needs purification. When supply comes through my hands, I pray God purify that bill or that coin and all coins and bills all over America. There is greed substance, lying, cheating, dishonesty on our money and intense manipulation. It goes all the way back to the beginning and you've got to know the story of the Federal Reserve, the banking system, how it works and begin to study under those economists who are going to show us what is the best way to go step by step from the horrendous condition we're in back to point zero the way we should be. God doesn't straighten the axis all at once and he doesn't make your soul come suddenly into alignment with a Christ to create cataclysm. God does not want cataclysm in this economy. You don't have to have it. But the buffer between us and cataclysm is intense violet flame. It's like landing an airplane without landing gear. You've got to put out the foam on the runway and then it can land. That's what we're trying to do with America. We're trying to save America without the proper equipment, without the proper gear. So you need a cushion and it's the light, the Emmanuel, the violet flame, the intensity, and that's the only thing that's going to absorb the shock of the change and the alchemy that has to come. And you're the instrument of it. You're sent forth with it. You can do it if you will. The science is there. It works. The biggest challenge you will have is not the world and not America, but yourself. Your biggest challenge is yourself to keep that self aligned so that in the process of meeting that karma day by day you're not going to let that karma unseat you, unhinge you, divide you and weaken you and make you come down to lower levels of manifestation. 
That's your psychology. Your karma is your psychology. It's your subconscious mind, and you've got to pin it. When you see yourself doing those things you don't want to be doing, pin it, expose it, demand it be exposed, and demand it be surrendered. Give the violet flame and go on. Don't condemn yourself. Don't look back. You're a warrior in the field. You may make some mistakes. You may slip and fall, get up. Just keep on going. There's a stride to the coming revolution. You keep on walking. Doesn't matter if you're weary or scarred or in any way somehow not as perfect as a shining angel standing in heaven. That shining angel standing in heaven is apt to be Lucifer or Moroni, that moron. He's a moron because he thinks he's the eye. He's a fallen angel, and I expose that to you. That is a fallen angel that stands in the sky. He is not an angel of those who remain loyal to the I am presence. And you are not supposed to imitate these mechanical robot-like fallen ones and wait until you're perfect before you raise your hand to do something. I've seen the most humble people and the most humble words deliver the most fiery message because their hearts were pure and everybody heard them, everybody got the word, they heard what they had to say and they were galvanized into action. So here, not with alliances with a carnal mind, but sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. This is what the fallen ones have done. They've convinced us we should fear them. And the only thing we have to fear is almighty God and our own returning karma if we have misdeeds. Let him be your dread. How can we have anxiety or doubt when we are in alignment with God? The only thing to fear is our own misuse of his law, and then we have to Im implore mercy when we know that karma is going to return and we're going to pay the price. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a jinn and for a snare to the inhabitants of, of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. That's the testimony of the Ark of the Covenant. Isaiah is instructing them to protect that covenant. And where does he say to seal the law? Among my disciples. Isaiah had disciples. There was a law to be transported. There was a judgment coming. They may suffer, suffer dispersion. They may not get together again. God is warning them, protect the teaching, seal it in your heart, carry it with you, because you will be called upon to deliver that teaching in future times and days, and you will have to know it. And the only way you will know it and remember it when you come again is because you have it by attainment in your heart. And what is not in your heart, you will not remember and you will not bring back with you. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. God will not be seen in this era of returning karma. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Isaiah had the immaculate concept of his two sons, the one the sign of the remnant, the one for the rushing to the spoils. He had the inner understanding of the conception of Emmanuel within them. He tells you very simply that he goes in unto his wife, the prophetess. She conceives and bears this son. He has the total dignity of understanding himself to be the prophet, the bearer of the seed, and he sees those children not because of their righteousness or their unrighteousness, but because of his immaculate concept of them, of the Emmanuel in them, that they are a sign, he and his sons a sign. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Don't feel sorry for people who reject and deny the message. 
I see this again and again in chilas. They somehow believe and they keep on believing in the face of the wickedness of the seed of the wicked that somehow, somehow, they're great people, they have all this attainment, they're real nice guys, they're real nice people to be around, they do anything for you, they're always in that friendship position because they want to be friends with light bearers because they want the light. And somehow, chilas can never believe the handwriting of action. If people keep on denying God and keep on doing things against God, why do you keep insisting that they are children of the light? If they do not believe this word, they have no light in them. That is the message of Isaiah and the ascended masters. Leave them, go on with them, whether they're family, friends, relatives, or lifelong companions. If they continue to deny the living light within you, stop apologizing for them because you're going to inherit their karma if you don't watch out. There are souls of light all over the world and I found out long ago that the people that have come to me were not the people that I began with, not my family, not my friends of earlier life. No, they are the people of God. They're my inner family. They're a spiritual community. And Lanello has brought you to me and not because we have somehow these outer ties. We have inner ties and we have been strangers until we have met at the altar. And that is what makes us one, and that is the great beauty of our oneness and of our family. We're made of the same stuff. We're uncompromising for the light. And it's only the non-compromising body that's going to save the earth. And you don't have much time. So if people reject the message, remember, their rejection and their reaction has already created a tie to you. That which is hatred binds. You're the source of light. If you gave them the message that they reacted to, they will never forget you or your message. Believe me, they'll be talking about you for years to come. <laughs> I had this funny dream. It was a dream where I was sitting somehow on a, a high curb by a sidewalk and I was sitting with Tom Miller and Randall and Edward Francis and we were talking there about the law and the teaching and everybody who went by was looking at us and examining us and examining us and I couldn't understand it and I said I said to Tom why are all these people looking at us and he said because we're so loud <laughs> the loudness was the aura the loudness was the light you are a walking neon sign <laughs> when you speak the word it antagonizes the carnal mind. So let people react to you, let them deny you. Don't sit and argue with them for two hours. You don't have time. You go on, you preach your next message, you go to the next city, the next door. You keep on planting the seeds. You leave a little chart of the presence or a little folder with somebody that's fighting you. But don't give them your light. When you sit and argue with people, you're giving them energy. That's why they love to argue. The fallen ones always argue, always quote scripture, or this or that or the next thing. They're always arguing, but they never come to the knowledge of the truth. Arguing is enough. They take your light from you. You have false hopes that you've got a convert because he's so curious. Oh, tell me about your religion. Tell me this, tell me that. And you spin your yarn by the hour only to find out that these people are just hanging on to you until they are filled and fattened with the light and they go their way and you feel depleted and you say, what happened? They took your light, you took their substance, and now what have you got to give to the child of light coming down the street who is ready to drink the full cup of light that you just gave away because you were in sympathy with a guy who says, feel sorry for me, I have this terrible habit and I can't get out of it. Feel sorry for me, I'd like to believe in God, but I really can't. He's not canting, he's wanting. He just said, I won't believe in God, but he wants you to feel sorry for him. Now don't get in that rut because the world is full of people like that and you're looking for the undiluted suchness, the undiluted essence. The Buddha recognizes it and the souls are there and they're waiting to be plucked. So go on your way because just around the corner is someone who's waiting to hear the true message. So you have to call a spade a spade. People reveal themselves by their actions. I don't care if you're in love with them. I don't care if you've known them for years. If year in, year out, they blaspheme God and deny you this teaching, there is no light in them. 
and go on because you're not fulfilling your divine plan and you've got to stop being in love with yourself and being an idolater and worshiping somebody's person and telling yourself how wonderful this person is and they're so talented and so great if they could only come into the teaching. Well, it just doesn't work and they don't come into the teaching and they're no asset to you, they're no asset to the brotherhood. And you should see the stern eye that Moria has for these people who hang around and hang around and take the light of the chilas and take your time. But he has an even sterner eye for you who put up with this nonsense. And believe me, he doesn't allow me to put up with it. And one is taken and the other is left. And they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward and they shall look into the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. God knows they will not repent. They will curse their king, the embodied uh, one with a mantle, and they will curse their God. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath a light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. The joy of the people is not in God but when they make money on the market. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. All of this going on. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The absolute promise and covenant. The absolute promise and covenant of God in the midst of all of this descent of darkness and karma. This Emmanuel will be born in you if you keep my covenants. Collectively as a community, if you remain one as undivided. But surely, individually, man for man, woman for woman, and child for child. And the zeal of the Lord, the zeal of the Lord is the union of the great light of Alpha and Omega within you when you keep the faith and the trust in God, when you keep your mind stayed upon Almighty God, the perfect peace of Alpha and Omega is one, hence you have in your heart the Christ consciousness. And what does this Christ consciousness produce? The government is upon his shoulder. You do it, Lord. I'm not adequate to the task. Let God be magnified in me and let him be the ruler and the lawgiver. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, always there with the right advice, always there as the teacher, the guru, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the mighty God, the mighty God, the I am that I am, the everlasting Father, the great person, and the Prince of Peace. So this God becomes actually four persons listed. The Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So all four persons of the Deity manifest as the solution to the problem 
through the child that is born. Now usually we see the counselor as the Holy Spirit, the wonderful, the counselor, are separate beings. So there are five, excuse me, there are five beings counted. The wonderful, the counselor, the mighty God. Now you see the mighty God as El Shaddai, often referred to as the person of the great destroyer and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has the offices of being destroyer as well as teacher. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives to the mother the counseling. The woman is always the bride of the Holy Spirit. And when the soul is wed to the Holy Spirit, the soul becomes the instrument of the teaching in the feminine form because in matter. The wonderful, the full of the wonders of God. So all of the offices necessary for the solution to world problems comes through the Son. So finally, now, the ending of this chapter, the Lord sent a word into Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Whatever happens in the economy, recession or inflation, they're always there to say, we'll solve the problem, we'll come with this, we'll come with that. But they don't come to the Lord. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and join his enemies together, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth, for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out. The stretching out of the hand of God in the descent of karma is not pulled back, which is the final message today. The descending, returning karma in full strength is not withdrawn until the people ask for forgiveness, until they bend the knee and say, we recognize the hand of the Lord in action in the course of events in our life. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the hand, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. So those who lead in government, those who lead in religion, the false prophets, are the head and the tail of this serpent that God will cut off. They are the false leaders, the false leaders. And they that are led of the false leaders are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. They do evil, the karma returns, they do more evil, and the hand still stands to return that karma. For wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest and they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, and shall, he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Instead of eating the light, they eat their own substance misqualified. The karma returns, their own arm, their own product of their sowing, and there they consume themselves again and again. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, and they together shall be against Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. 
the unrighteous decreers and their unrighteous decrees are all those who misuse the word of God the power center there are black magicians witches the false gurus there are the prayers of malintent that come forth from the orthodox circles and there are the damnable decrees that go forth in the secret chambers of councils of the government and the economy all those that issue the misuse of the word shall be judged and this is what we see today today's initiation and lesson that we are about to receive has to do with the purging of the desire body and the purging of the orifice of God I want you to receive it in peace and attunement so I'm going to give you a brief 10 minute break to stretch and come back for the dictation in the name of the Father the Son the Holy Spirit and the Mother let the Word of God be sealed in the hearts of the devotees in the name of Mother Mary Amen.